retroactively say Mark Siegel was one of the original Stonewall rioters. Ellen Brody was the organizer of the first Pride March. And we're going to hear next, second Pride March. And we're going to hear next from Harry Brass, who was editor of Come Out newspaper. Well, I was one of the editors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All of you, all of you here, uh, I'm just absolutely overjoyed by this. Before I begin, I want to talk about the Come Out Reader that you can get uh, from Blurb. It was uh, put together by Stephen Dansky, one of our brothers. Uh, How to change that. I joined Come Out in its third issue. The first two were more what I'd call new lefty with reprints from Rat and Liberation News Service. There were tributes to the Cuban Revolution as well as some ideas as in Bitch, Summer's Not Forever, <laughs> and Marty Stevens on How to Change the World. Martha Shelley emerged as a major writer with a piece called Step and Fetch It Woman. I loved its beginning said, lesbianism is one road to freedom, freedom from oppression by men. Lois Hart described GLF as, are you ready? A turbulent, violent, and divisive collection of opposing and attracting forces that coalesced sufficiently that the embryonic spirit could be named, but all the while the spirit gets stronger and more harmonic. Yes. <laughs> the paper was coming out of an apartment that Linda Rhodes and Ellen Broidy rented in the East Village. The area was cheap, seedy, and exciting. For someone who'd been almost apolitical, every come out meeting was like being plunged directly into GLF politics. Ideas were hurled at me and I had to jump hard to catch them. Although come out was run as a collective, Lois and her lover, Suzanne Bevere, were the foundations behind it. Especially Lois, who had to convince me that all men oppressed all women, and as revolutionaries, we should refuse no act of rebellion against patriarchy. She reduced me to tears once by announcing that, as revolutionaries, we had to seriously consider blowing up the Metropolitan Museum. <laughs> it was a bastion of male art. <laughs> I had spent many happy hours at the Met. The artist didn't conspire against women, I protested. <laughs> Lois disagreed, and we should also consider blowing up the Metropolitan Opera. <laughs> the opera was just an upper-class pastime. Shosky on the famous snake, book, snake pit raid when a desperate illegal immigrant named Diego Benales, jumping out a second story window to escape the cops, impaled himself on a wrought iron fence spike. Allen said, A young man impaled on an iron fence recently became a macabre but powerful symbol of the oppression of homosexuals. By the fourth issue, I had become more accustomed to come out. It seemed to come together magically, like how did woman-identified woman, which was unsigned except for radical lesbians, get to us? Or Stephen Dansky's wonderful Hey Man, which years ahead of toxic masculinity declared that gay men foolishly exalted the masculinity of our straight oppressors. I genuinely like the collective idea that a group of people worked on the paper, but everyone brought something very special to it. This was so GLF. The fifth issue included an account by Martha of the August police action following a demonstration in Times Square called Gays Riot Again, with a group of searing photographs by Steve Rose, a straight professional news photographer who gave us his work free. Also, there was a piece by Pat Maxwell called The Emperor's New Clothes, which looked at art from a very honest perspective, basically that gay artists were presenting their real queer selves, it was just that nobody wanted to admit it. The issue also covered the Christopher Street Liberation Day March, 
A lot had gone on in this year, especially with our Come Out Collective. About halfway through production of issue six, which accidentally, in very GLF fashion, was labeled issue seven, <laughs> Linda and Ellen, who had generously given us space in their apartment, decided that they needed the room back again. Also, Lois and Suzanne left the paper. I was approached by Linda. When I take Come Out into my own apartment, I protested that I knew nothing about producing the paper, and I felt very inadequate. I had ripped off the paper. I was now running it all by myself, and I had driven the women away. <laughs> None of this was true. There were still many women working on it. The cover was by Ellen Shumsky, with many pages covering GLF women as well as radical lesbians. Martha Shelley, Martha Shelley published a great piece called Subversion in the Women's Movement that got reprinted and even translated. The issue also had a photo by Donna Gottschalk, over here, that decades later was reprinted in the New York Times. Third World Gay Revolution had a double page, 16 point platform and program piece that ended with, we want a new society, a revolutionary socialist society, all power to the people, <laughs> of course. So you can read about Third World Gay Revolution and come out, then turn to the feminist, vehement, flaming faggots poem that said, isn't it time we said yes to faggot? that we proclaim our own martyrs. But soon afterwards, I was approached by members of Third World Gay Revolution with a demand. They wanted one quarter of the paper for themselves. They'd create it, and the collective would simply produce it. I thought this shouldn't happen with the collective, and I, I was supported by other people on the collective, like Martha, Steve Gavin, Debbie Moldman, and Roy Eddy. At the same time, with more rumors flying, this being GLF, Bob Kohler <laughs> called me. The street transvestites action revolution decided that they wanted a quarter of the paper too. <laughs> he warned me if they couldn't get it, Star would set fire to newsstands in the village and so <laughs> You can imagine this going on. I was wrecked by this, but the members of the collective made me feel that made, just, made me just feel right about the decision that we'd come to, and believe it or not, Star didn't burn a thing. <laughs> The seventh issue of the paper carried a lot about Cuba and also an account I'd written about the massive May Day demonstrations in Washington that shut down the Capitol. The masthead had 18 names on it. Issue eight, the last, was as revolutionary as ever with pieces about the effeminist revolution as well as, of course, s and in the revolution. There were photos of a women's weekend and a piece by Dennis Altman called Coming Out in Australia. GLF no longer existed, but could the paper, which was such a microcosm of us, exist without it? The collective was tired. I was having a nervous breakdown, and even getting out of bed had become difficult. It was painful for me and many other people to separate ourselves from come out, but it was time. It wasn't just a paper, but it was ourselves really in print. As Steve Gavin proclaimed, holding up a fresh copy, this is history. He was right. Looking at it now, I can only say that there's nothing that's been